everybody. 20. I do encourage you to come tonight. Um, that's another seat wrecked. Um, I, I, um, I understand that we've created our own little culture of how we do church. Who's to say that that is the only one that's right? But who's to say that you're not allowed to do it any other way? And tonight, all the churches, or pretty well all the churches in Gaul will be here, and uh, things will be done differently. We try to do things a bit differently most of the time anyway. But things will be done differently. But what will be here will be unity of the Holy Spirit, or unity of the people in the Holy Spirit. You will see a group of pastors who get along well and love one another. You'll see people coming together to work to make something happen. And uh, I was just with a couple of ladies this week that walked in to have a coffee. And I said, oh, you'll be here on Sunday night from another church. And they said, oh, we love it when we have it here. So it would be really sad if we didn't show up. You know why they love it when they have it here is because of the atmosphere of the place. That's what they say. The atmosphere is much better than an auditorium that we hire. And you know why there's such a good atmosphere in this place? Because we've created it. Be really sad if we're not here. So let's come. Uh, even if you don't normally come on a Sunday night, just try. It's six o'clock, so you know. I know you've got to set your recorders to make sure you get your favourite little programs and all that. Um, because I know you're not having prayer meetings all afternoon today. So, so just 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 come, all right. And let's just see if the Lord can't command a blessing in the place of unity. Come on. That's, what I, that's the reason why I love it. And I, I love the fact that they've chosen to come and have it here, not just because I like it better here than in other halls, but because it says something. It actually is a major statement about the attitude of the town. Because years ago, it was very, very strong that they wanted it in a neutral venue so that it would be open to everybody and people wouldn't feel bad about coming. But right now, they say, since we've started having it here, it's been much better and we want to have it here, and we, we, and I say to them, hey, you know what, you want to go somewhere? No, no, we feel it says something about our heart and attitude towards one another. So it's good. So let's be here tonight. I can't remember who's preaching. I know it's not me, because I'd be really nervous right now. <laughs> it's just not me. Okay, let's, um, let's go back to this whole thought of sons and heirs of God sons and heirs of God. Lord Jesus, I just pray right now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll help me to express this, probably one of the most important um, concepts of the Christian life for us to grasp and understand. And I pray that you'll help us to grasp it today. And Lord, I know there's every possibility that in my own way I can muck this up and not present it well and not get it over well. But you're here today by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I just ask that you will take the words that I say and, and the words of your word that I read and, and even your own words and speak them into people's lives today. Bypass anything that I muck up and make it work in our lives. I pray that today we'll walk out of here with an understanding, not just mental and educational, but inspirational and heart. I pray that we will be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name, amen. Someone said, the notion that we are children of God, his own sons and daughters, is the mainspring of Christian living. Our sonship to God, and let me just say once, it's a generic term for all of us, okay? Our sonship to God is the apex of creation and the goal of redemption. So to me, the topic that we're looking at at the moment um, even though it's part of our whole identity in Christ, um, to me this is probably the crux, perhaps the most important thing that we grasp. You need to get this. And I, 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 I beg of you, if I don't do it good enough or if you want to go further on it, or anyway, dig into the very concept of the fact that you are a child of God. There's lots of scriptures on it. Um, it's, it, it, we see it in the Old Testament, but without the same power and inspiration that it has in the New Testament. But it's there, and we need to look into it and understand it and recognize, I am a child of God. You need to grasp that. So there are two transactions that uh, cement our status 
as children of God. One of those we've talked about last time I preached, and that is about our birth. A pointer to that in Scripture is John 3.3. 3. Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And I remember a few years ago now, Carly and Gemma and I were traveling to Edithburg, and somehow we got onto the topic of the new birth, and we began to talk, Carly particularly grasped or loved it because, of the, um, because she's studying midwifery, and we talked about the, um, all the references in particularly the New Testament to birth and childhood, or, you know, the, the whole conception and, and all of that, they're all there. And we talked about a few of these the other week. And, and Carly, I know, was getting really excited, hadn't realized there was so much of Scripture that pointed to this whole birth concept. Now, it is a spiritual birth, not a natural birth. But the facts are, you become a child of God by birth. We are born into the family. Our birth into the family of God gives us the flow of his DNA, or more biblically, by which we become partakers of the divine nature. And through which we take on his image. And so the whole birth concept is that, you know, um, we, we see families where you can see an incredible family likeness um, in, in the children. And, and the image has come because of the parental DNA that has been passed down. And somehow it's just connected in such a way that it's made a very strong family likeness. And that's the biblical concept that we are divine, partakers of the divine nature. And therefore we become reversing back into the image of God that we lost way back when Adam and Eve fell and so we are born into his image we become members of his family and we have divine nature flowing in us the idea isn't that it's supposed to take a long time for that to take place unfortunately we kind of resist different bits and we don't grasp certain bits and we don't dive into certain areas but we're supposed to be coming back into the image and that's the whole purpose and we talked about this at length some time ago the whole purpose of the death of Jesus was so that we can be conformed into his image and become children of God in the fullest sense which will be of course when we see Jesus we will be like him that's the first transaction the new birth the second transaction is called adoption which some commentators indicate is the is the thought that's included in many references to our relationship to God in the word sonship in many places in the New Testament could be rightly interpreted adoption the, the concept doesn't allow for us to become sons by natural birth, but we, uh, we were spiritual orphans, spiritual slaves, and so firstly we are born again, and secondly we are adopted into the family. Now I want, I want to let you know right up front that if you understand the Western adoption process, it's nice and it has some connotations to scripture if that's the right word but the adoption process that we're talking about here is far more complex and far more legally binding etc etc than that it's the roman form of complex uh, of adoption Paul, being a Roman, understood the concept. And he was writing here, uh, in, in some cases when he wrote about adoption, he was writing to the church in Rome. And he knew that they would grasp an understanding of the concept of adoption. And so I want you to try to go beyond our Western thinking, where we see a child, we like a child, we bring it into the family, and etc. And, 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 you know, it's a, it's a beautiful concept. And I suggest to you, if any of you have any resentment, about being adopted that you consider the fact that you were chosen you know I got stuck with my kids but you can choose an adopted one I know there's one of them here that's why I'm looking over this side of the building but there is something beautiful about the fact that parents would actually choose to take not just a child because, you know, basically once we engage in the sexual relationship, we're opening ourselves to the fact that we will have children. So it's not just that they choose to have children, but that they choose to have that child. 
There's something very special about that and you ought to keep that in mind even though it's perhaps got a lot of trauma attached to it for those of you. And I think a lot of the trauma comes as to where we've come from rather than where we're going to. But, but just try to get past the natural Western style of adoption and let's look at what it all really meant. You know, the most obvious reference to this is Romans 8.15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So it's through the, the concept of adoption that we obtain our guarantee of rights and privileges because, listen to this, when you become an adopted child in a Roman family, you actually are given the full rights and privileges of an adult member of the family. So it goes beyond, we just took a little kid into our house and let him grow up and become part of our family. At that moment of adoption, you actually receive full rights of an adult member of the family. That is powerful. When you think about the fact that when you gave your life to Jesus, you were adopted into the family and we refer to new Christians and new babies in the Lord and we use all that kind of phraseology when people come to know Jesus facts are that when you became a Christian whether it was a week or two six weeks a month however long ago or whether it was many years ago at that moment you were entitled to full rights as an adult member of the kingdom of God and the family of God get that into your spirit you don't have to wait till one day when God will give me what is rightfully mine. It was yours the day you gave your life to Jesus. You may not have understood it then, but it was yours. A little bit like, you know, we adopt a little baby into the family and put a set of keys up on the wall in his room and say, they're the keys to the murk you're going to have. And he can sit there and look at the keys for the rest of his life and think, well, won't it be wonderful one day, one day, one day. But it's not like that with us. All that's written in the scriptures, whether you understood it, the kid doesn't understand what a merc is, doesn't understand how to drive a merc. You don't even know what I'm talking about when I say merc. A Mercedes, Benz. So baby doesn't understand the rights, but they're theirs. And we have full adult rights. And if a New Christian, one day old new Christian, is quick enough to grab it. They can have it all. It's not a case of you've got to grow into some of these things. It's yours. It's yours. Then, of course, we, we have to learn to understand and to walk in it. But it's ours. The adult rights. And that is a very powerful part. So you might say, oh, are you reading that into Scripture? No, I'm reading that into the concept out of which Paul was writing. So... What I've talked about, the new birth and the, um, the um, adoption, are not two separate experiences. You know, um, I, I said to Laureen, I, I want to make sure that people understand. I'm not saying you get saved, you get baptized in water, you get baptized in the, or you get born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, adopted, sanctified, justified, you know, and, and we've got to go through all these experiences. Adoption and new birth happen at the moment. It's two transactions within the one act. It, it's, it's a very important that we grasp. We don't get born again here and then adopted over here. When we are born again, we are adopted. It all happens at the same time. And so the moment I give my life to Jesus, I have full adult rights. I am in the family, no questions asked. But we do need to remember that it's all ours through our belief in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Nothing you can do. No work you can do. There's, there's nothing you can do other than believe in order to be saved. When you're saved, you're adopted. So there's nothing you can do other than believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Roman world in the first century AD, an adopted son was deliberately chosen by his adoptive father to perpetuate his name and inherit his estate. That was why it was done, mostly. In almost every case they can find of Roman adoption, it was done 
from an inheritance point of view. It was done so that somebody would carry on the family name. There are illustrations in history that talk about people who had no child. Um, like people multiplied millions of dollars type of people, multi-millionaires, and they had no child. And so they would adopt a son in order to hand on the inheritance, the family. It was very important that the family name carried on. In fact, one commentator says it was also very important that the family had an ongoing spiritual head who would lead them in family worship. Now, they weren't Christians, they worshipped other gods, but that was important to them. And so it was incredibly important there was someone to carry on the name, carry on the inheritance in the family. And so it was a very deliberate act. And, and the commentator that I was reading or I'm quoting says, he was no wit inferior. He was no wit inferior. W-H-I-T. Beats me, eh? So I looked it up. And it says, it's not, a wit, W-H-I-T, is not in the smallest amount imaginable. So he was not in even the smallest amount imaginable <laughs> inferior in status to a son born in the ordinary course of nature. So they might think, oh, well, I was second choice. I wasn't born into the family. I were. When they're adopted, there's none of that. There's no inferiority status. They are equal to. In fact, I came across an incredibly interesting point in a number of commentaries that says, that this baffles me, but it's nice, that it is possible for the adoptive family to disown one of their natural born sons but it is totally illegal and impossible to disown an adopted son in the context and I thought to myself and actually one commentator did refer to this that Jesus the actual son was disowned for a moment of time so that you and I could be adopted and never ever legally disowned again. So you think God changed his mind about you after he got to know you? Tough, he can't. He can't. It's just not allowed. It's not legally possible. It can't be done. He can't disown you. You think God threw you out of the family? You may have walked out like a prodigal son, but you can't get thrown out of the family. Because you're an adopted child. I wasn't going to tell you that, but you can have that for free. <laughs> so it says that they're in no way inferior to the son born by the ordinary course of nature and might well enjoy the father's affection more fully and reproduce the father's character more worthily than a natural born son. Born son. And sometimes, and in our case this wasn't it, but sometimes a child was adopted because the father didn't like his own son, didn't want his own son to carry on his name. It's quite an amazing thing. Ad adoption was much more a customary legal procedure in Roman society than either in Hebrew or Near Eastern culture. Paul, being a Roman citizen, would have fully understood it. A Roman would often adopt to acquire an heir to his estate it would generally be a male of any age the moment adoption occurred several things would happen i want us to look at them right now what would happen when adoption occurred number one the adopted son got a new name you know in the bible names are incredibly important um, you've got jacob his name meant deceiver cheat crook so crooked he could hide behind a corkscrew. The name didn't mean that. But that's actually who he was. God changed his name to Israel, which I believe means prince. Jacob didn't immediately become a prince, let me tell you. There was still a few things needed to be beaten out of that boy's life. But God named him that because that's how he saw him. So he gave him a new name. And you see that numbers of times in scripture where a new name was given or even to a baby a name was specifically presented and prophesied because that was to speak of who that person was. Peter is a New Testament example of that where Jesus said, 
Peter, no, Simon means reed, blown with the wind. But I'm going to call you rock, immovable. And uh, I think we see that with Peter, don't we? We see those early years of Peter's, uh, where we call it ministry, discipleship, where he seems to be, you know, all over the place. And then suddenly he just locks in. Probably the day of Pentecost did it for him. He just locked in and he was, he was going for it. And he became one of the greatest. In fact, some churches even claim him as the original. Um, you know, but he became one of the greatest of the apostles. Why? Because Jesus changed his name, spoke into him a character, so he gave him a new name. I am not exactly sure that it means that... I shouldn't tell you this. My mum was going to call me Samuel. But she got, she got advised by family and friends that that name can be changed and whatever and cho chose that she didn't particularly like the, the other derivations or the other um, ways the name could be used. And so she decided to call me Paul. I'm pleased she did that because all my friends call me Paul. <laughs> but, but, you know, as I look at my life, and please understand, I'm not suggesting I'm anything like the Apostle Paul. But as I look at my life, I think Paul suits me much better than Samuel. I'm not a Samuel. I'm a little bit on the side of Paul, but I'm not a Samuel. And I don't know if that was God that caused my mum to change that, but I was pleased. I am pleased. I've thanked her ever since. And if you're called Samuel, that's fine. I don't dislike the name. I just dislike it for me. But, uh, but you know, it tells us in the book of Revelation on two occasions, Revelation 2.17, to everyone who is victorious, I will give, and I've just left some bits out because it's irrelevant to us right now, to each one a white stone. On the stone will be engraved a new name. So you're going to get a new name. You've got a new name. It's already been made up. I will give them a new name that no one understands except the one that receives it. So I guess that could be a little bit like um, you might have a pet name for somebody. And I don't mean it like Fido. <laughs> but you might have a pet name for somebody. And when you call that name to that person, everybody else could look, huh? I didn't know that was your name, or what does that mean, or whatever. And you, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, nobody else understands it. You understand it, but nobody else understands it. And Jesus has got a name that he's going to give to you. No one else will understand it, but you will. And I'll guarantee he's so clever that when he does it, that name will suit you perfectly, and you will wear it with pride for the rest of eternity. Revelation 3.12, all who are victorious, I will write on them the name of my God. They will be citizens in the city of my God, and I will also write on them my new name. And I thought when it said my new name, is he going to write Jesus in another language? And then I thought, no, no, it'll be his new name for us. It'll be the name that he wants to call you. And in fact, already calls you by that name in some ways because he sees you as you are in that new name. And so... The first thing that happened was the adopted child got a new name. The second thing is his father instantly, oh, I like this, his father instantly became liable for all his actions, debts, crimes, and all that sort of stuff. Don't you like that? So the moment he came into the family, the moment that service happened, the ceremony, and it was a big ceremony, the moment that ceremony happened, Dad takes on all the liabilities and crimes. Now, I don't think that means we ought to go out and commit lots of crimes and liabilities so that one day we'll get taken over by some guy and he'll pay all our debts. Um, you know, Twiggy Foster would be a great adopted father, um, and I'm sure he could clear up my minor debts. But, um, but, but that's not what we're saying, that we should go out and do that. But whatever has happened in the past, all those debts and stuff are instantly taken over. Theologically, adoption is very, very closely related to the concept of justification. The quick interpretation of justification is just as if I'd never sinned. 
justified, just as if I'd never sinned. That's the quick meaning if you want to understand it. And so when you became a born-again Christian, bam, you were justified at that moment. We talked about this earlier when we read, uh, some time back, when we read a scripture that said, uh, when we gave our lives to Jesus, that, um, how did it say it? He gave us right standing. You see, if you've committed crimes or you've got massive debts, maybe you've been declared bankrupt, there's a degree in which you don't have right standing in the community. And you'd understand that. Um, if you've been there, you would understand it. People look differently at you, etc., etc. But when you give your life to Jesus, you are given right standing. Theologically, you are justified. In other words, the records have been expunged. Do you know that word? I haven't looked that one up. I just thought of it. But the word, ex I didn't make it up. The only word I've made up is the word plagiarism. Um, <laughs> the word expunged basically means wiped out, never to be seen again. This is not just a sealing of the records. You know, if you watch any crime shows, you'll see that your records can be sealed, particularly a juvenile's records can be sealed, and nobody's allowed to answer, open them. But it seems to me, certainly on the TV crime shows, that they can get a warrant under certain circumstances, and they can open those records and find out things. This is not just a sealing of the records. This is an expunging of the records, which means the records are gone forever through the shredder, into the fire, extra heat, up in smoke, ashes buried or thrown across the sea, whatever. I don't know. But there's no way that record can ever be known again. Except when us silly people bring it up again ourselves. You know, if you had a, a really bad record in real life, you had a really bad record and it was expunged, you think you wouldn't want to go around and tell everyone, oh, you know, I, they all think I'm good, but a few years ago I murdered my grandmother. You know, you don't, you don't go around talking about it. It's gone. It's forgotten. But we do. We do. God has expunged the records of our past. He has taken onto himself all of our past sins and liabilities, and yet we go to, around talking about it. Now, it's one thing to be giving your testimony, but even then, let's not so glorify our past that it gets lost. I, I can remember we would have guest speakers come years ago who would be, you know, big hero converts and so we'd get them up and let them tell their story and they'd go for 45 minutes telling their story you know 40 minutes of that would be telling us what a bad egg they were and then for five minutes we hear about how Jesus you know they walked into a church together like Jesus. And, and I understand that I'm not being critical of it but let me say let's glory more in the change in our life and the new life that we have than in the old past that has been expunged and the Bible tells us even God can't remember it. Now I know Kim is going to say because he always does God can do anything he likes but you know what when you have made a choice not to remember and you've expunged it it's never going to come up again and God has chosen he has said I will never remember your sins again and he has wiped them out of his memory and you can be assured that even though I'm here on my knees again and I'm not sure why right at this moment you can be assured just in case, just in case you can be assured that no matter how bad you go you know if you've got a child that that comes uh, good and they're, they're doing really well and then they fall again you're just as like yeah I knew it wouldn't last God's not going to do that because they're gone I think there's two references. One is as far as the east is from the west, and I could never work out why it didn't go north-south, but apparently north and south meet somehow, but east and west never do. So as far as the east is from the west, that's what they tell me. He's put our, our sins, and also he talks about he's cast them, I think, in one passage into the deepest sea. And uh, you know, certainly for a long time, man couldn't get down there. I'm not sure that man has ever yet got to the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean. But even if man can get down there, he ain't going to find your sins because God's expunged the record. Uh, do I need to labor this any longer? Is there anyone still sitting here with any conviction that your sins are still remembered by God? I hope not. Because when he adopted you into his family, it was all gone. It was all gone. And whether it be you, 
family or friend, if you could call them that, or the devil wants to remind you of them. You ought to just think, well, my dad doesn't remember them and I'm not going to. Stories told of Martin Luther, who the devil came to him with a long list of his sins and said, Martin, here's all the things that you've done wrong. And Martin just took out a red pen and wrote across it, paid in full. My dad had an experience similar to that when he was dying. We were called into the hospital. Um, well, actually, it was the morning after he passed away. We were called in and they said he slipped away during the night. And the nurses told us that um, during the last moments of his life, he went crazy. And we said, how do you mean he went crazy? They said, well, he was talking to somebody the whole time. And, and he was talking about how this... Uh, He's talking about how, I don't know whether they said the devil or how we found this bit, but it was all in the, the mealy of those last moments that Dad had been saying that the devil had come into his room with a wheelbarrow filled with his sins. And my dad, who we all think this of our dad, he had a fair few. Um, my dad, who had, had some failings that I didn't even know about, found out later, said something like, Jesus has paid for all of those and taken them away. Let me tell you something. We need to get our theology right so that in a moment of crises like that, when maybe we don't have full control of our faculties, the subconscious kicks in because we know that we know that we know it's all been paid. You see, if you, if you waver on this one, in those moments when you really need the faith to believe, it's possible for you to say, oh, yeah, Maybe I am a bad guy after all. But if you know that you know, if your theology is right, if you've got it all sorted out in your heart and spirit, when that pressure comes, your first response will be the right one. And that will be, hey, say what you like. My father doesn't remind me and I'm not about to let you remind me. Get thee behind me, Satan. I hope you realize one of the things that happened when you became adopted into the family was that all of that was gone. Justification focuses on the believer's legal standing as forgiven and accepted as righteous in God's sight. Romans 3, 30 and 33 says these words, Moreover, whom he predestined, the, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified or restored to them the glory. So when you gave your life to Jesus, you were given right standing and you were given the glory that we lost way back there. But verse 33, I read it this morning and I saw it in a bit of it, or yesterday rather, I saw it in a bit of a different light. It said this, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is, it is God who justifies. And that it is God who justifies is stated straight after who's going to come against you. And it's really saying this, if somebody brings a charge against you, how in the world can it be God? Because it's God that justifies. He expunged your record. Why would he bring a charge against you? Yeah. So if there's any form of condemnation in your heart and life, you need to realize it's not God. Mm, very good. If God's telling you what a wicked sinner you used to be, and all that stuff, if he's doing that to you, if, sorry, if you think it could be God, you need to get into your mind. How can it be? God has justified me. God has expunged the record. I don't know how severe the word expunged is, but go home and look it up. I hope it really is tough. The, son, the adopted son had new obligations to honor or please his father. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, a lot of the adoptions that we see in Roman history were into rich families. And uh, I think if I were adopted into a rich family, after the family I was in, let me tell you, I'd be a very happy person. And I, I think I'd be really happy to, um, to honour my father. Mind you, we should honour him, our natural father, rich or not. But, but, you know, after living, and you, know, you may look at me and think, oh, it's all right for you, you wouldn't know. I lived in an incredibly poverty-stricken family. We had a guy break in once into our house and he looked around and left a check on the table. Um, <laughs> hang on, look, Shree, we didn't have a table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a chair. <laughs> but, you know, I was so poor, we couldn't pay attention in school. Now, I'm cracking jokes about it, but let me tell you this, we were a very poor family and known for that. 
So if I was adopted into a very rich family where I immediately became heir to everything, you'd think I'd say, wow, I'm never going to knock this. I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live in this family. I'm going to be a member of the family. I'm gonna, my dad, you know, he, he gave me all this stuff. What a great father. Now, I know these days, it doesn't matter how much you give your kids, they think you haven't given them enough. But surely there's got to come a point at which we honour our father. That's what becoming an adopted son is about. It says in Ephesians 2.7, talking about us coming into the family. It's just after it said, but we were all dead in our sins, but he's raised us again in new life. In verse 7 it says this, So God, and some people resent this and think, what an egotistical God. Come on, give me a break. After what he's done for you, yeah. this is what he says. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Don't you think that God ought to be allowed to point to us and say, hey, these are my kids and they show you how good and kind I am to my family. They show you how much I love my family. You might sit there and say, what's he done for me? He forgave you. He expunged your records doesn't matter what else he's done for you. Okay, so he didn't give you the extra dollar in your pay packet when you wanted it, but you're saved. Let's knock off the whole prosperity stuff. The prosperity that God has given to us just by saving us far exceeds the prosperity of Bill Gates, Warren Tuffett or whatever his name is. I can't think of him right. That old Buffett. Oh, I knew it was something to do with food. Um, <laughs> Or whoever else put together. Yeah. Frankly, if I've got to exchange something for all of that money, it ain't going to be my salvation. I got three kids. Oh, no, that wouldn't work. Um, I, no, if the, <laughs> it went over most of your heads, and am I glad? I, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing in this world. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Absolutely nothing. So surely for that reason we ought to be honoured to stand out as an example of the goodness and the beauty and the power of our God and the grace that he's given to us. Let's, let's display it with pride. When God makes you an example, when he perhaps asks you to stand up and say something for his glory, let's not back off and say, oh, I couldn't do that. Yes, you can. Surely anybody who understands the greatness of what God has done for them can take a moment to say, I have a great father who loves me and blesses me. The next thing that happens, or another thing that happens, is he loses all of his rights in the old family and he gains all the rights of a legitimate son in the new family. He legally got a new father. So Ephesians 2 tells us this, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. Jesus actually said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. So we used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in this unseen world. He is the spirit at work in our hearts of those who refuse to obey God. You used to live there. Where do you live now? You live in the arms of your beautiful father. Yeah. Believers are in fellowship with the father. It's not a case of dad somewhere around the world somewhere and he, he kind of thinks of me every now and again and sends me a little card to say hello because he's a traveling salesman. So nothing like that. He, we live in fellowship with our father. He never leaves us. He's with us all the time. And we love him for that reason. You know, the Bible tells us that Father knows our physical and spiritual needs. Uh, in, in, in his care, he supplies everything necessary for our temporal and eternal welfare. Not even a hair can fall from your head without him knowing it. Galatians 4, 7. Now, since you are no longer a slave, but God's own child, 
And since you are his child, ah, oh, sorry, I've jumped a line there. No, I haven't. I've mucked that up badly. So we were talking about you lose your old rights in the in the old family. <coughs> I. I think if I look at my previous father, the devil, and I compare him to my new father, God the Father, hang on. If I look at the devil, my old father, I can't compare him. The gap is way too wide to my new father. Why? How do I... Wow, I got out of that. I got out of that. No longer part of that. And legally, that family, you've lost all your rights in it. And you've lost, they've lost all their power over you. In fact, the, the Roman term, I think, was pato. I forget the term. But it, the, the, the Roman term means that the new or the father, the person that is called that, that whatever that term is that I can't remember... Um, which I wasn't going to worry about this morning, but it's just good. The, the Roman term for that father is someone who has complete and utter rights and control in your life. So when you change from one to the other, this pato, whatever he is, loses all rights, all control, everything, and you come under the complete and utter control of the new father. Have you caught that? Yeah. He is my father in every way possible. And the other bloke, he can't come back in a while and say, I'll take you back, thank you, I'll rip up the documents. And if we get to it this morning, you'll see that it's made that that can't happen. Then we come to where I accidentally jumped in, and that is that when he became a child of the adopted father, he became a legal heir to his new father's estate. And, and it's so... The adoption was so secure. And the airship, is that not a thing like the flies? An airship is so definite and permanent that even a new child born into the family cannot supersede his heirship. They become joint heirs, perhaps, but he can't supersede it. You know, if you look in... Um, no, I forget that bit. But if you, you, you can't do it. In fact, there were some people that adopted a child in order to make sure that the, the, the estate went to a person they could trust rather than their own son in Roman history. It was so legally binding that the new child cannot, the new adopted child cannot lose the inheritance to any other sibling because it's their legal right. So whatever you've gained in Christ, let me say this. When you were talking before, by the way, about greater things shall you do, it just occurred to me, you know, there are more people get saved into the church of Jesus Christ every day in today's world than probably in the history of Jesus' ministry. I think we're doing greater, don't you, collectively? It's a staggering, staggering thought. But I don't know why I went... Oh, so... It doesn't matter, therefore, if, you, if you're part of this church, and we're, you know, we've got around 500 people who say this is their church. Um, it'd be lovely to see them all together on one day, wouldn't it? Um, so we've got about, you know, and, and you might say, oh, you know, if we ever get bigger, I'll miss out. Well, one could think that, but what about if the inheritance is so big, it wouldn't make a scrap of difference how many people were heirs to it. Like those girls in the Johnson & Johnson family arguing because they only got $250 million each. 
excuse me, but I'll take it if you don't want it. <laughs> you know, the inheritance is so great that there is more in God for you than you can ever possibly consume, if that's an okay word to use there. And we are heirs to all of that, legally have every right to it, and it cannot ever be revoked. And I guess the reason it was so strong is, you know what, you chose this kid, there's no way out. You adopted that child, you are now legally bound to stay with that child for the rest of your life. And God chose us. You might say, I found Jesus. Oh, yeah. You weren't even looking for Jesus. He was the one that found you while you were wandering aimlessly in your lost fog. So he chose us. He has predestined us to be transformed in the image of Christ. It was his decision. So there's no way he can revoke your airship to everything that he has. And You know, I like to think, and it's an awful thought when you go there, but I like to think that, you know, it's a little bit like if you want a drink of water and you decide to take a straw and go to the Murray River and drink from the Murray. And I know it's awful because of the water, but, you know, Naaman was told, just dump in that river by faith, don't worry about going home to the clean river. So let's stay with our beautiful Murray River. And you might think, but if I drink too much, there won't be enough. Come on. Much and all as we've had droughts, it's never run dry yet. And it ain't about to run dry because you're sucking a straw out of it. And it doesn't matter how much you draw back, draw down on the inheritance in the kingdom of God, you can never drain it. You can never make it run out because there is so much backed up for, for eternity that you will never, ever drain what God has got for you as a legal inheritance. <coughs> and that's where that scripture comes. Now you are no longer a slave. Very often, the adopted son was a slave in the family and they adopted them and they took them from slavery very often that's what happened because they got to know the child and they loved them, they trusted them. You know, if you look at Abraham with Eliezer, Eliezer was his servant and he actually said, because I have no son, I want Eliezer to be an heir. Now, he didn't legally adopt him or anything like that and God said, no, he won't be your heir because of another one coming called Isaac. But he loved him. He would got to know him so well and Eliezer had proved him so well, himself so well in the family that, that in Roman culture he could well have been adopted into the family and have had been the heir to that family. And so this is what this scripture is saying. And Paul's writing to Roman uh, people or people in that kind of community. And he's saying, uh, you are no longer a slave but God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. The old life of the adoptee was completely wiped out. We've kind of touched that, but I want to go back to it. Any past debts were legally cancelled. The adoptee entered into a new life for the old life and had no part. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Let's put it into a little bit of today's context. And I know it's flawed, but every story we come up with will be flawed. It's a little bit like when, you, again, you see the American crime shows, you see someone goes into WITSEC, witness protection. And, and when they go into that, their name is changed, all their documents are changed. If they've family, got family, their family go with them and all of that's changed. And they put into a new place, in a new house, into a new environment and everything to totally protect, protect who they are. And it's all done so that the old is gone and the new is there. They've got this new, whole new life. And... That's a weak picture of what happens with us. When you were adopted into the family, you became a new person. You have a new identity. You have new papers. Your record's been expunged. And so therefore, any bills, and I don't mean natural bills. We, we have to be honourable and stewarding. But, that, but, but all of that stuff, any, anything that you're carrying is gone, and you are a new person. Are you getting that? 
Some of this sounds a bit repetitive, but you know what? You hear the negative stuff so long, so often, so much, that it doesn't hurt you to hear it repeated over and over again. We're a new person. When you gave your life to Jesus, for some of you, very recently, for some of you, a long time ago, you became a new person. The old life was taken away and you have a new life. The new life is, is empowered by the DNA of God himself. You are written in to his family as a legal member of the family with rights to everything that God has. Everything. And though we will never technically be equal with Jesus because he is God himself, and I haven't found any of you yet as a candidate to take that spot, we will be so like him and we will be entitled to what he has because we are co-heirs with him. I think that on this day when we rejoice that the church was born, it gives us great cause for rejoicing that we were born. And I don't know what date you got saved on. I know for me it was a day somewhere in my eighth year of life I don't know the exact date and don't ever get condemned if you can't remember the exact date but do remember that you're born but you know what today we can celebrate we, you know it's a little bit like the Queen's birthday I think it doesn't matter I mean in a few years time they'll call it the King's birthday and it'll probably be the same date because it doesn't exactly matter what date we corporately all celebrate that date and it might be like a family who decide we're tired of buying all these birthday presents. Let's just have one birthday for the whole family in the year, you know. Um, so this is the church's birthday. And so whether you were actually saved on the 4th of June, whatever year, doesn't matter. We can celebrate this corporately today. This is the day when the church was born. Therefore, my birth was already in the records. This is the day that I can celebrate, we can celebrate corporately as a day of birth. I think we ought to stand together and we ought to celebrate our birthday. You may know the exact date. Why don't you celebrate that date? But I reckon we ought to stand and thank God we were born and adopted into the family of God. And we're going to